question. Um, I think it's an important one. Uh, so I'm Rick Livingston. I'm the Associate Director of the Humanities Collaboratory and also um, uh, one of the um, one of the people behind the Center for the Humanities in Practice, um, which is uh, has been for the last few years the kind of locus for um, career diversity uh, among uh, graduate students in the arts and humanities. Um, so uh, it's an outgrowth, CHIP was an outgrowth of the uh, next gen uh, PhD committee, which convened um, back in 2016 to 2017, if I got that right. Anyway, Barry Shank, who's, who is here, was, was head of that. And um, uh, Danielle Fossler, who we say is, is, was a proud member of that, that committee. Um, so we're very pleased that, that she agreed to kind of uh, host this um, conversation. So um, career diversity was for lack of uh, a better term. Um, is what uh, we're thinking about. Often people refer to Alt-Ac or employment beyond the uh, tenure track. Um, and um, one of the things we've learned in the last uh, um, three, three or four years uh, is that career diversity is not just an individual uh, issue of job placement, but rather has to do with uh, um, the life of graduate students and indeed of the academic curriculum across the board. So one of our uh, efforts in the next few years has been to, to stimulate conversations around um, what graduate students need, what, uh, what the graduate, uh, graduate education looks like, um, and how the various parts of the, the university can um, uh, better support uh, the uh, graduate students in in uh, um, the current the current uh, uh, outlook for for uh, employment. So um, we asked uh, Danielle obviously to to host uh, this meeting um, and uh, Melissa Curley of the Department of Comparative Studies, uh, who's been actively engaged in in um, reforming their curriculum. Um, to, to talk about that, and Jackson Stotler, who is the academic program specialist in WGSS, uh, also to contribute, and um, they have conferred. So I'm very grateful to them for having agreed to, to do this, and again, to all of you for, for showing up. And with that, it's over to you, Danielle. Cool, oh, thank you so much, Rick and Jared, for having us. Um, I'm Danielle fosler Luce here. Um, I'll just briefly introduce Melissa and Jackson um, and, and then, you know, kick this off. This is meant to be a conversation. Um, so hopefully interactive and lively. Um, so Jackson Stotler, uh, who uses he, him pronouns, is the Outreach and Curricula Senior Specialist for the Depar Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. As a passionate advocate for the benefits of cohesive curricular design and embedded assessment, he coordinated the curricular redesigns of the WGSS graduate and undergraduate programs and has assisted with ongoing redesign efforts in geography. Jackson is particularly interested in the direction of graduate education, and he contributed last year to um, the Graduate Studies Working Group uh, that was organized by Dean Ryan King that considered these issues. So Jackson, we're delighted to have you with us. Um, Melissa Anne-Marie Curley, who uses she, she, her pronouns, is an associate professor in the Department of Comparative Studies. She served on the department's graduate studies co co committee over the course of the two year period in which the, the department redesigned its graduate program. And she has served as graduate studies chair since the first cohort entered that redesigned program in fall of 2020. Um, so I just wanna kick this off by noticing where we are. Um, since 2008, we've seen an erosion of tenure track opportunities for new PhD graduates. Some people have argued that we should shrink or eliminate doctoral programs, but doing so, in my opinion, would not align well with Ohio State's land grant mission. And the need for graduate training persists. Employers want to hire people who have creative and critical thinking skills, the ability to describe the world as it is, but then to imagine how it could be different and how to get us there. They want communication, information literacy, ethical reasoning, and the ability to think through human problems. These skills are cultivated in women's gender and sexuality studies, comparative studies, 
and indeed throughout the arts and humanities. Um, so that's sort of the, the frame for our conversation today. Um, and Melissa and Jackson will help us think about our graduate offerings and where we go from here. Um, throughout, everyone's welcome to put questions and topics for discussion into the chat. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on it and uh, drawing from it um, as we have our discussion. Um, so Jackson, would you like to kick us off? I would love to know what you see as the possibilities for WGSS graduate students today, what they need, and how is the program supporting their needs? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> well, thank you so much for having me here today. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, and <clears throat> to, to, to start with this about what are the possibilities for our graduate students today? I, we, we talked a little bit in our, in, our, in our early discussion prepping for this meeting to say that we all kind of think that we have a little bit of the model backwards in how we focus on um, outcomes for our students and that <clears throat> so much of the undergrad world right now is so focused on what are our undergrads going to do when they graduate? What, are, what jobs are they going to get? How are we going to, what kind of competencies and skills are we going to get them and build them to make them um, uh, available to, to be placed in these careers? And it, it seems like if we could allow undergrads a little bit more freedom to explore and to have some leeway and do some of those things and come to those things a little bit more, maybe more naturally, they might have some better outcomes. And conversely, we allow our graduate students to maybe flow a little looser than we might want them to take away with some of these more concrete skills to prepare them for a variety of careers. As we know, so many of them come in, regardless of the status of the market, with this concept that they will be the special one that gets the, that gets the elusive tenure track job, um, that they will succeed. And then oftentimes we see them work through these graduate programs and get towards their, uh, third, fourth, fifth year, and suddenly have the realization, oh, I don't want to pursue that career as a faculty member. What all of the preparation that I've done has been for this, what am I going to do differently? So in terms of what I see as possibilities for our graduate students, just as we, as we kind of said earlier, I'd love to see WGSS graduates uh, go into every single possible field. And they do, in fact, go into every single possible field, um, especially at the, after the graduate level, taking off with these, these concrete skills in research, in thinking, in, in uh, critical study, to infuse them into areas of, of law, of social work, of, um, of, of justice work, of any, in the academy, out of the academy, all of them. I wanna see them thrive wherever uh, they feel called to do so, as I personally think that feminist studies are applicable to, well, literally every piece of our uh, uh, current uh, world. Um, and in terms of what they need then in order to achieve that, I think they need a couple of things. The first and foremost thing, meaning that they need to, to realize that their scope is a lot broader than just going into a faculty position and to come in with that understanding and then have that reflected in the program and in the college, that, that the support for going out to pursue something broader than this very narrow mindset um, is the first thing. It's, 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 it's much easier to be something that we can see. And so having that um, mirrored as a possibility and showcased as a possibility, I think is very important. Um, how is, in terms of where our program is in, in supporting those needs, we can do better. Um, when we underwent our redesign a few years ago at the graduate level, we did so more so out of necessity of the constraints around a diminished number of tenure track faculty who were able to support the program, um, the need, the, the direction of the field in terms of reflecting current academic interests, releasing our students from a, a, a very lock and key structure that had previously been established for the PhD program in particular to open that up. But what we, what we were hesitant to do at the time was to put in the requirements of say a, a, a colloquium or a, a seminar that would be focused exclusively on um, professional development or job preparation. Uh, in part because as I'm sure many of you have experienced there's hesitancy within faculty to uh, potentially either be seen as supporting jobs outside of the academy and in, in perhaps as a fear that um, they're saying that their own positions aren't as relevant. And I think there's a hesitancy around wanting to advise pathways that they don't feel comfortable advising in. Um, faculty know how to be faculty. Um, faculty don't have typically 
really have much experience pursuing uh, an alternative academic career. And so there's hesitancy around misadvising students and that, that hesitancy then becomes so great that the, um, we don't take it up. And so we, we, so we do still have that gap. We have um, continued to try and build in um, professional development for our students on a, on a basis. We've done some collaboration pieces with other um, arts, humanities and social science departments to try and work and, and offer some of those things. Um, but the key piece that I think we are missing, and that for those of you looking at curriculum design, I would encourage you to consider, is we don't, um, we have the carrots that we dangle, but we don't have the curricular stick, which I think is a good idea uh, to, for both um, the program to encourage us to actually make sure that we're doing it every year, and for the students to make sure that they're actually taking these opportunities seriously. And sometimes I think it's a matter of you get someone in a room and at least they've listened to it and maybe they don't take it up right yet, but maybe in a couple of years they say, oh, I have been to a seminar that, that has taught me how to um, think about a resume instead of a CV. Um, and so we didn't build in that requirement that they do that kind of professional development. Um, and that's where I wish we would have done that. And I'm continuing to push that we do make that a piece. Uh, but how we can support them, we're limited in scope by the number of, uh, by our size and people that we are. And I'm sure that many of you are facing these same constraints of, uh, it, it's a, we're coming out of some thin times and hopefully it looks like we're going, maybe going into some, some more feasting times, which is lovely. Um, but how can we all help uh, make that possible is something I'm really interested in talking about today. Um, with that, I'll, I'll kick it over to Melissa. Thanks. Melissa, you've been to a, a redesign recently. Um, yes. Tell, tell us from your point of view, um, how did that go? What were the needs that you addressed? Um, and, and what are you seeing? Sure, thanks for that question. Well, I must say, uh, as Jackson knows, the WGSS redesigns that he was involved in really loomed the large over our process uh, in comparative studies. Uh, because we were given the WGSS redesign as a model and a benchmark to kind of strive for um, achieving the same degree of um, meaningful transformation. So it seems sort of exciting to me now that, that you know, now we can actually be in conversation. Um, let me, uh, let me limit, let me, let me put a block on my natural tendency to go on and on and on. Uh, I'll say uh, one thing about the process and two things about the outcomes of our redesign and then hopefully uh, we can move into a conversational mode. Um, so the process that we undertook uh, was uh, guided to a large uh, degree by our colleague, uh, Teresa Johnson from the Drake Institute. Anyone here who has who has done an, uh, work with the Drake Institute in terms of course design will surely already be familiar with the process of backward design uh, that they really uh, emphasize and teach so well there. And the idea of backward design is that in a, at the course level, of course, as many of you probably already know, instead of starting with the topics and content that you want to cover, you start by articulating your big goals. And having articulated your big goals, you let the goals determine uh, how you'll do assessment and what kind of material you'll take up in the course of the semester. Uh, for our program redesign, backward design meant that, uh, well, it meant, it meant two things. Uh, first of all, it meant that although we started with a self-study where we, we got feedback from faculty and graduate students about the program, and the self-study was very illuminating in that it told us a lot about what we, what we were not doing well uh, and what we were missing, we didn't make the self-study the basis of the redesign. And I think if we had, uh, which we could have, uh, we would have then entered into a very reactive process of thinking, well, these, are, these are the things that we're failing at. 
And are we going to say we're failing at those because they're not important to us or we're failing at those <laughs> because we don't have resources, so we have to scramble to find the resources? How are we going to repair uh, the problems in the program? We didn't do that. <clears throat> Having done the self-study, and this was under the leadership first of uh, Teresa Delgadillo and, and later Philip Armstrong, uh, we set aside the self-study and convened uh, what Teresa uh, referred to as these dream sessions. At the dream sessions, faculty got together and rather than talking about what we weren't doing well, we talked about what we wanted to do well, right? What did we want to really excel at? And what did we want our students to do well and to really excel at? And it was out of that really um, kind of joyful articulation of the things that we wanted to do well together that we um, developed our list of six goals for the program. Once we had the goals, we worked out how will we know at the end of the, at the, end of the graduate program that someone has indeed achieved these goals. And those were our outcomes, like the kind of final assessment you would do in a course. And once we had the uh, outcomes, uh, we asked ourselves, well, how do you get from zero to uh, achieving this outcome? That's the same as identifying the kinds of readings and activities you would do in a semester, right? And those were our proficiencies. So now we have a very robust set of proficiencies uh, that we are able to, first of all, create situations in which students can uh, practice and acquire those proficiencies as a department. And then we can measure year after year uh, their success in achieving those proficiencies. And we know that if you're progressing from uh, beginner proficiency through the intermediate proficiency up to the advanced proficiency in, for example, collaboration, then at the end of the program, you're someone who knows how to collaborate effectively. We know that. Uh, we created a situation in which we were able to learn that. So what have we actually done in, the, in terms of transforming the program? One thing has been, I think, uh, noticeable, and one has not. Uh, but actually, I think it's the thing that's not yet so noticeable that's going to turn out to be really important. So the thing that's noticeable is that we have made some changes to the curriculum, uh, some really exciting additions to the curriculum. So we have always had in comparative studies a, a, a real interest in uh, theory, and we've kept that mm, because one of the goals we have is to produce students who are fluent in that way of thinking about things. We think that's really valuable. So we still have foundation courses that expose students to that theory and give them lots of opportunities to work with it. But we also know, well, we want our students to be very good at collaboration and we want them to be very good at bringing humanities-based research to public audiences. And we really want them to be good at teaching. These are all um, uh, skills that, you, that they can develop, right? So now in addition to our foundational theory courses, we have, a course in um, public humanities, which I think is very deeply influenced by the work that Barry did uh, with the folks in CHIP. And maybe he can say more about that. Uh, we have a course in um, pedagogy uh, and we have a course in collaboration. One thing I'll kind of put a plug in here for is that I think when I look at our curriculum and think about constraints in terms of the size of the faculty, uh, those three, teaching, public facing humanities and collaboration, all seem like really, really golden opportunities to work across departments. And it would really benefit the faculty in terms of energy, but I also think it would bring a lot of energy to the classes to have students from lots of different disciplines and interdisciplines together in those kinds of endeavors. So maybe that's something we can pursue in the future. Um, so that's the, that's the kind of noticeable change. If I think about students who are coming in under the new program, they're, they're in those three courses that are different from the courses that their senior um, colleagues in the program have taken. 
here's the thing that's not so noticeable that I think is really, really significant. Um, all of those proficiencies describe skills that our students will acquire by the end of the program. They are all, I believe, transferable, translatable skills. And they're mostly not very different from the kinds of skills that I and other members of the faculty already had. So it's not the case that we looked at what we were able to teach people to do and said, well, in addition to teaching them how to do this, we also need to teach them how to make videos or we also need to teach them how to do accounting. We didn't have the pressure of saying to ourselves, what we have to offer is actually, it's not enough. It's more than enough. The skills that we're training people to develop are, I think, I'm saying this as someone who used to work outside of the academy, exactly the same skills that I used in my earlier kind of professional managerial class job, right? I mean, this is also a professional managerial class kind of job in some ways. So what I'm thinking about lately um, is an observation that has been made by a number of people that one of the things that afflicts faculty, especially I think faculty in the humanities, is a kind of conviction that we don't have any skills or the skills we have are so narrow. They're only good for this one very neurotic kind of place. And so we're, we're trapped in this place, we can't go out. But that's not true. <laughs> it's not, that's really not true. But it, I think it impacts the way we talk to our students as well. And perhaps leads us to suggest to them that whatever they're learning from us, it's not, not only is it not translatable, but it's actually making them incapable of working outside of the academy. So there's a kind of, I think it's very useful to look at all of the, to look at and name all the skills that you have to have in order to do this kind of work and naming them for the students so that they can say, oh, I see, I'm actually, I have all the skills I need to manage a complex project. I have all the skills I need to collaborate successfully. I have all the skills I need for intercultural communication. Uh, it's not just that they get them, they really do get them, but also I think the proficiencies are very helpful in letting them know how to articulate what they have. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and it strikes me that 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 list of skills that's articulated, and I, I've put the link to your uh, program goals and outcomes in, in the chat, um, that list looks very like the list of traits and skills that employers want. Mm -hmm. um, was that in your view as you made this, this no. list? No, it wasn't, which I think is amazing. <laughs> I really think it's amazing in terms of how it speaks to uh, the truth of what you're saying, Danielle, that these are actually desirable skills, and yet we're very genuine about them. There's nothing instrumental in that set of uh, goals, outcomes, and proficiencies. They're all really meaningful to us. So I think that makes a big difference in terms of the enthusiasm we can bring to, to creating situations in which students can learn those skills. Yeah, and I, I hear both of you talking about a transformation in, in, in maybe how we name the content, how we talk about the things that we're teaching. And I also hear you talking about um, how the faculty communicate expectations to the students, um, what we think they're going to do and what we hope that they will do. Um, and that that's an area that, that we, might, we might come back to. Um, it seems urgent to me to first talk about resources. Um, right, that, that your new public humanities course might be a resource for people very broadly across the arts and humanities and maybe beyond. Um, Jackson, you talked about um, collaborations as being important and feeding the work that you did in, in WGSS. Would you like to talk more about that? Sure. Um, so the, the collaborations are key as we're coming in this mode of 
everyone is spread, is stressed too thin. No one has enough faculty right now um, in their in their departments. Um, and how do we manage that load? And so, you know, we, we designed the, the graduate program. It was born out of that need to, to figure out a way to actually be able to just flat out staff the classes that needed to be taught to, to get this done. Um, but as I think further about collaboration and the, and the type of resources that are needed to go forward, um, I think about, well, wouldn't it be fascinating and fantastic if av as we as we think about, okay, the next iteration of things and how to build it, if we were in communication and in collaboration with a department like comparative studies and talking about, oh, you already do that public humanities class, that's excellent. Um, can we, um, I, cross listing is, um, I have many, many feelings about cross listing, but perhaps it's more of a, uh, a rotational offering system within, you know, and, and so which which units can can offer a class like this and how do we support each other? Oh, you're teaching a pedagogy course. Here's our pedagogy course. How do we um, share pedagogical resources and teaching strategies across to lighten everyone's burden so that those classes that do then become the foundational courses that need to be taught every year could potentially be shared amongst multiple faculty and alleviate the burden or the teaching responsibility from just one person taking it up and having to carry that charge every year. Um, and then in, in, in lieu of that level of, of collaboration, the collaboration between departments to offer things like open colloquia, to, to have folks come in and say, to bring in the resources of, and I know that this already has happened and I think this is, uh, an excellent example, I think Danielle is happening in um, the languages, correct? And how to bring in um, skilled speakers to talk about a variety of different external career pathways, ex skill sets for more specifically to to uh, things out in, in that realm and uh, allowing uh, multiple different units and departments and graduate students, not just to encourage, but I, I do love requiring students to go to those things, not just as we as we as we see with many things that are uh, throughout the academic year that are require encouraged but not required, we get that we all hit that burnout peak where we're like if it's not gonna if I'm not being told to do this I'm not going to go because it's just not my priority and and that's just that's how our lives go. So the requiring students to go to those things and 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 putting that baking that in there uh, will I think then beget those and and make those even better. When they're when they're pushed to become even better, and the model of shared resources in in our particular historical moment, um, when we're all feeling so pinched, uh, that that seems really really promising to me, um, and and so sensible when we're trying to build something that would meet the needs of a lot of different kinds of students across across the disciplines. Um, are there more opportunities? That both of you see for um, things we can achieve with our current within our current capacity limitations. Um, what where's the low hanging fruit for programs? The one piece I do I do want to one circle back to 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 make sure I'm saying to and be clear. I I don't want uh, collaboration to be an excuse for them not investing in something either. That's the one, and that's I think where people sometimes get uh, get concerned about like oh well we're making do with with just with just spreading this around and sharing it this way and not and using that as a as a as a reason then not to try and bolster it or make it better or pour resources into it. Uh, I do not, I'm not calling for that by any <laughs> stretch of the imagination. Um, these these are very uh, important things that do deserve um, finances and staffing and attention um, from everything. Um, I think low hanging fruit is first of all things like this where we can talk to each other. That's <laughs> step one, Chip. For free. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And Most I'm thinking ladies. about, yeah, I'm thinking about the uh, the paired examples that you two brought up in, in our earlier conversation about a very kind of um, uh, relatively low stakes way to encourage uh, graduate students uh, considering an internship, which Jackson mentioned is just, we'll give you three credits for an internship. You set up the internship, have a, a meaningful experience, that's three research credits. Yeah. I think that is so useful uh, uh, 
both in terms of kind of creating a space in which a student can think about that as an option and pursue it, and also signaling the department actually believes that this is legitimate. We, we think this is worth doing. And then Danielle, of course, has talked uh, uh, about um, the, the very labor intensive version of that, uh, that, that you have pursued for your students, where there's a lot of, of um, faculty energy around finding the funding and creating the internship, uh, which is a sort of, uh, for me, a sort of ideal, but obviously uh, incredibly uh, time, consuming, <laughs> time consuming and demanding. Yeah, yeah. not at all low hanging. Yes. yes, clearly we can't, um, we can't fund all the interns as GAs, much mm -hmm. as we would love to. Um, so we're going to have to be thrifty and smart um, about the resource piece. Um, the thing I really appreciate about both versions of, of, that, um, of that opportunity uh, is that I think the more that the more that we can articulate to our graduate students that what we hope to uh, what we hope to create for them is a situation in which they can acquire skills rather than a situation in which they can identify a kind of um, persona that they can adopt and then live into for the rest of their lives. Uh, the more I think we open up the possibility of uh, a, a space for, for them to ask uh, more often and more sincerely, which parts of this do I actually like doing? Right? And how can I how can I develop a career path where most of the time I'm doing the stuff that I really that I really like to do and that I have become good at? Yeah. You don't need to be a tenure track. <laughs> you don't need a tenure track faculty position to do the stuff that you like to do. And in fact, some of us may find that uh, getting the tenure track faculty position reveals a whole world of stuff that we don't like to do <laughs> that we have to do, and um, then we're not that good at. So yeah, I think I think uh, I think the internship is a great a great way of either discovering the possibility of a different career path or making a connection with a, a community partner that can support your academic work, right? It's a real win-win. Yeah, win-win was exactly what I was thinking as you were talking. Um, and it's interesting, the people who come to us thinking, I want to be a professor at a small liberal arts college. I mean, I've heard that speech a, a thousand times. Some of them don't know what a professor job actually looks like from the back end either, right? They've seen the teaching. They have not necessarily experienced research or service um, that can be huge parts of that job. So part of career exploration is getting them to look closely and talk to people who are doing a, a variety of kinds of job and, and sort of test those options against who they are. Um, that seems like you're inspiring a kind of conversation that will lead them to make a smart choice for themselves. What are you hearing back, both of you, from students about your program changes? Um, are they telling you how they feel about what's happening? Um, I'll jump in on that one first. Uh, yes, they are, the, in, the, in the program changes that we made, our, our biggest um, concern was uh, really unlocking the um, the tight knit boxes that our program had previously made kind of set up for students that, that had formerly reflected the research interests of the and of the faculty, the direction of the field. And then by saying like, actually the field's not that anymore. Let's um, stop forcing you to pick a very narrow track. Um, students have really enjoyed that. They have, they're really getting a lot out of um, faculty get to teach cutting edge seminars on current research. They really love that, that's great. Um, and they have really enjoyed certain aspects of the program that involve our, our pedagogy class is always very popular with our students. And so is the research and writing seminar that we have them do where we essentially teach them how to actually uh, research and write, which is, which is a, a good concept that we shouldn't just assume that students are able to do at the graduate level. Um, Outside of that, we do still hear uh, some echoes for um, in, we do an annual survey of our graduate students just to kind of take a, 
uh, temperature of the program. And we do still hear some things about um, wanting more professional development type pieces. Um, and so, so far, a lot of that is falling to individual advisors or is helming the grad studies committee at the time to really try and influence that and put those offerings on the board. But those duties um, don't always, that type of professional development uh, doesn't always get emphasized. I do, however, also ask our students in that, in the, in that question, um, when I ask them, you know, if you want more professional development, did you attend any of these opportunities that are available to you throughout the university from, from be it through career services center, be it through um, OUAB, be it through arts and sciences. Um, and frequently the ones who said that they wanted uh, opportunities for more professional development didn't attend any of those things. So that's also the, the circle back that I kind of give them the gentle reminder of these things do exist and we do need you to uh, perhaps go to them if you are saying that you want them. Um, so there's 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 room for for things to to get a little bit stronger, uh, but I am I'm pleased with where we're at, uh, where we where we were and where we're at is as a needed change. Thank you, Melissa. I mean, I I will say first that um, I really feel uh, <laughs> I hope none of them are here because I like to be um, more uh, stoic when I'm talking to the students. Uh, but uh, I really feel for the students who entered uh, in fall 2020, coming into a, a, a significantly redesigned program and uh, under pandemic conditions. I mean, the twin challenges of that, I think have been really uh, spectacular and the, the uh, grace with which they have navigated those challenges has been very impressive and very moving to me. I think one, one sign of success, uh, you know, it's early for us, but one sign of success for me for sure has been the extent to which uh, the students in that cohort and the, the newer uh, uh, small cohort admitted under uh, equally kind of severe conditions have really um, uh, come together in real, real meaningful mutual support, despite the difference of the kinds of projects they want to pursue. And a second sign of success is the concrete work they've been able to get done. Uh, one of our innovations has been to develop a, an, what we're calling an interdisciplinary learning laboratory. This is a, a year long course that asks two faculty to work together in designing and uh, facilitating the course. Uh, and the course, part of what the course is about is interdisciplinarity and part of what the course is about is collaboration. Uh, and the two faculty members are uh, coming from dis different disciplines and working together. So we are supposed to show them, oh, these are the fruits of interdisciplinarity. This is what effective collaboration. This is one way collaborative partners might work together. So we've just entered the second semester of that course. And uh, the first thing they have to do this semester is produce a call for papers for the conference that they will be hosting on their own in May. And I just read the call for papers uh, this afternoon and it's amazing. I mean, it's spectacular. They found these questions that they can unite around and be interested in and invested in. And they are uh, ambitious about what this conference is gonna look like. They have such good ideas and they're so professional in pursuing them. I mean, it's really remarkable. So, you know, I think we're lucky we have students with, with really a lot of different talents and capacities, but I'm very happy about how I'm very happy about how a framework exists in which they can deepen those capacities and use those talents. Yeah. And that seems really sort of rare and special in the arts and humanities where we focus so much on an individual contribution, um, an article, a monograph, a performance, um, to work on that kind of uh, collaborative 
skill as a skill. Um, that seems to me very innovative. And also it sounds very warm and moving for them to, to be able to come together and have that conversation. That has to be good for them. I hope that that's what they'll say at the end of the semester. I will be curious. Um, colleagues, do you have questions for us? You're welcome to put them in the chat or I think we are not so numerous. Um, and I can, I can keep an eye on the chat too. So if, um, as you guys are, if, but you can also just jump in because um, yeah, I think we're, we're not too big a group. Um, and I just want to thank you all also just before questions begin. I thought that was really inspiring. I have lots of notes knowing that, you know, that, you know, these two programs have, have gone through so much of this thinking already is also gives me hope. I mean, I do notice just one thing, maybe to start the discussion or one thing that WGSS and comparative studies have in common is um, these are programs with um, newer PhD programs. Um, if I remember correctly, I think the PhD programs, at least in their modern form, it both started, you know, in the time I've been at, at OSU, uh, both had MA programs, obviously, before. And I, and I wonder, you know, there's, I think part of what's so great about you guys taking the lead and doing this kind of, of, of thinking that is uh, showing that there are solutions to uh, problems that I think many folks in older PhD programs think are intractable um, really is kind of leveraging your, your nimbleness and your fact that you remember your, you remember the origins, right? Of that these things are built by human beings to serve certain ends, therefore they can be revised. Um, and so I just want to express my gratitude to, to you and all your colleagues for the work you've done um, uh, in this area. And with that, I will shut up and let others jump in. I think I would also add that this is brave work. Um, starting to name the purposes of a graduate program in the current environment is a scary task. Um, there are so many people who might tell us that what we're doing isn't important with graduate education or, you know, is this program worth having? So if even to wade in and start naming the purposes feels, you know, like you're sweeping back the tide with your broom. Um, but I do think that this, this work that both of you are engaged in and both of your departments are engaged in, Jackson and Melissa, um, is the work that also then lets us articulate the value of what we're doing, which has, I think, this very big implicate beyond the survival of each of our programs, the survival of our enterprise, I think relies on our ability to make that mm -hmm. case. Yeah, and so that you are making the case feels really important to me. Um, I do so sometimes and I'm wonder. grateful for that just, bravery. You know, I just wanted to maybe jump in a question maybe for others as well. I was really, I, I mentioned in the chat that I was really kind of caught up short a little bit, but also only because it felt absolutely true. And I'm guilty of using some of this discourse too, right? I don't have any skills, right? Which is, you know, I, I, I blush to say it, but right, it's not true, right? It's, I do have skills. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's been a re, on one hand, it's been a recourse that many of us have perhaps hid behind when faced with the, the daunting challenges of how to help guide our, our students into the wide range of possibilities uh, that include, but are also beyond the tenure track. But I don't think it's just about self-protection, right? I think it's also about the ways in which we have internalized inevitably as we will over the last 25 years, the, the growing dismissal and undermining of, you know, what was when, you know, when old timers like me entered we thought this was a job that had cultural respect, right? I mean, I've, I've literally watched it kind of erode and, and I think we've all to some degree inevitably internalized that within our classrooms, within our research, within our university space, we feel a sense of authority and identity, but the thought of exposing that. And I think this affects to some degree also our, some of our challenges with public facing research. Oh, nobody cares, right? Nobody. They, and I know this from working with the humanities centers, they do care, um, but even that's been really exciting. And so I think 
the issue you raised, Melissa, that we kind of have to also be thinking about how we're presenting ourselves to our graduate students, to get some of our swagger back um, and letting them know we, we have skills, you're learning skills, here's the skills you're learning, here's all the ways in which you know, they're going to be translatable into you know, tenure track jobs, para-academic jobs, jobs in the private or public sphere, et cetera. So I, I really appreciated that a lot. So Rick asks in the chat, um, if, if other folks here have curricular innovations that you wanna tell us about, um, changes that you've made, changes that you hope to make, um, you know, are, are there other shared resources out there that we should all know about, places we should be sending our students? So maybe I'm um, um, responding to Rick's uh, second question about uh, what role the humanities um, collaboratory could play in helping get the word out there. I was really struck by what Jackson, what you were saying about so many opportunities that are out there across the campus that our students are just so focused on their departments that they're not looking beyond. Um, I'm I'm devastated by that, you know, having worked at a smaller university where, you know, that's okay, maybe, but then to work at a research one institution and for students to be that narrow in their view of the opportunities that they have, um, for me, it's, it just makes me sad, <laughs> you know, so I just encourage students, especially when they just arrive, to make it a point to cast a broad net and explore things out there. Um, having a kind of an umbrella or a site, you know, that we as faculty take take it upon ourselves to to disseminate across our departments, but where students can see here is all that information, uh, the type of information that Jackson is talking about, I think would be uh, really, really great. The other um, thing that I find particularly challenging. Uh, it seems easy. It looks, you know, succinct when it's produced at the end, but it is really difficult to um, condense all of these ideas and thoughts into a statement. So when we talk about naming the values, naming the skills, um, that's that's hard for me. Like I really struggle with like having a succinct thing. It's like a marketing skill, right? Like to how can you how can you put that in a in a language that is compelling, um, immediately understandable? You know that gets gets traction, that is reproduced across. You know, uh, uh, different. Sorry, my phone is going crazy for some reason. Um, so that type of help, I think, would also be very welcome um, so that we can all uh, sort of not be on the same page necessarily. I, I think that, you know, we're, we're talking about different populations and different students, but at least to have that language that, that we can grab, you know, transform, edit, whatever, but something to start with as opposed to reinventing the wheel in each one of our different little corners of the university. Thank you. We very much need shared wheels. <laughs> um, and, and I do think there's a, there's a, a language we can learn um, in naming these skills. Oh, I might just... oh yeah, please go ahead. Oh, I, I don't, I, I don't want to be too digressive here, um, but I, I do think one of my sort of um, bugaboos has been for a while that the the humanities have gotten out of the business. I think each individual scholar out of the business of explaining the importance of the of the work we do in general, right? It, it, it's gone as uh, assumed that we know why it's important to read Shakespeare or to interpret Jackson Pollock's paintings or whatever the case may be. And, and I think if we, all of us individually got more in the habit of doing that, we'd find that we're drawing on these skills that have much broader applicability. Um, and, and so I, I think even for students staying in academe, right, that, that those um, abilities to say what we do and why we do it and why that's important to the larger community is, is um, also part of a good skill, skill set to have. So, um, but, but yes, certainly for students going outside as it were as well. 
And I'll just throw in my um, two cents to, to bolster Michelle's idea of a, a website that had um, all of this information, the resources about what's being done, you know, um, maybe in the graduate school or courses being offered, all of that strikes me as pretty, I've said this before, but relatively low hanging fruit and so useful. Yeah, and we've, and we've, I think that's an area where we're a little behind, but I think we can uh, start doing that and get drafts out to you all so you can tell us what's missing, um, what you have locally, because again, a lot of it is some, I mean, things are being created in local sites. I know things in the English department, for example, that exist as resources for our departments in, in print form and in uh, presentations, uh, you know, that may not be duplicatable in other or duplicated in other programs. Again, if we could network all those things or both for us to learn skills from each other and for the graduate students to find the, the answers and, and skills they need, you know, I think we're going to We'll make our side more efficient and make it so that all of us don't feel we have to become masters of all of this because that's mm -hmm. that's where we feel daunted i think so we will get to work on that thank you chip i'm thinking about both michelle and lisa's um comments one of the things that we are now asking our graduate students to develop proficiency in is uh explaining the significance of their research to non-academic audiences. So whether they seek an academic career or not, at some point they have to take the plunge of finding, finding, a, will, finding a willing audience outside of academia and, and explaining what the stakes of their work is and what they have discovered. Um, in developing the the goals and outcomes and going through that, that process of articulating what we're about as a department. Uh, something that strikes me now that I hadn't thought of in this way before is because Teresa Johnson from the Drake Institute was there with us in every meeting, she contributed tons of expertise of her own, but she's also just a very good listener. And in, Comparative studies, for, <laughs> I know some of my uh, friends and colleagues are here. In comparative studies, we have our own uh, kind of rhetoric that we will, our kind of uh, uh, jargon that we will sometimes lapse into, which really makes a lot of sense to us. And we feel very comfortable talking to each other in that way. And sometimes in these meetings, we would come up with this very juicy sentence that made so much sense to all of us and seemed so uh, concise and pointed. And Teresa was able to say, you know, I just don't know what that means. And that was really, really valuable uh, for all of us. So I think I, I, I so appreciate what Chip is doing in terms of bringing together folks in the humanities. And I think one, one service it could provide would be a kind of opportunity to try to explain ourselves to people who are not in the humanities and not even academics. Yeah, one thing where we're, Rick and I have been talking about is setting up a forum, kind of graduate student facing, um, where employers and um, you know local organizations can talk a little bit about not not offering jobs. We're not ready to get there. That's for next year. But talk about some of the skill sets they're looking for, right? Partly to kind of let graduate students know, wait, I can I can do this, right? It's not as daunting, and partly to let faculty know, oh wait, I can I can prepare my students for this. Um, but I also think it's a great occasion um, to provide, you know, some opportunities for the graduate students and to work with them in terms of getting them, you know, we do mock interviews for jobs all the time, right, for academic jobs. We all have good skill sets with that. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think will be good for us all to learn on individual advising basis is also how to prep for uh, mock interviews for non-academic jobs, an area where we might think we have very little skill, but once we have a better sense of what employers are looking for, I think we realize we can we can do this, we can help them. So we're going to, I think, creating more public-facing opportunities for for both for graduate students and faculty to be doing that. I think, as as Lisa said, I think that's a key part of the kind of culture change here. Um, we think we are disconnected from the world outside because we've internalized this message that what we do is unintelligible or, or not meaningful. 
But the minute, I think all of us know this from personal experience, the minute we talk to the world outside, we realize how interesting they are and how interested they are in what we're doing and that we should be making beautiful music together. And when we do that, we help our grad students. Mm -hmm. uh, can I just interject that, that I think that Melissa's point is that that was really important that um, having somebody who is not a total outsider, but is um, a, a third year or, or at least, uh, you know, listens to different things because you don't want it to be sort of um, start with the assumption that they don't understand anything. <laughs> Um, and you don't want to talk down to, to people, but you want to have somebody who can act as a check and have, as a filter can say, you know, I'm an intelligent person who, know, who knows lots of stuff and this isn't making sense to me or I need more explanation or whatever. So that, that intermediate position. The, the one thread I just want to pull out quickly that I think we've talked about in every mode that we've uh, encountered today is really pausing for a moment to say why and ask why in these, you know, in, 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 in asking why is our graduate program what it is uh, and, and really unearthing that why, um, why is what we do important and articulating that. Um, and for those of you who are advising graduate students, Danielle, I'm thinking about the, the, the speech that you've gotten a thousand times about, I wanna be a tenure track faculty at a, at a small liberal arts college. Um, I remember the first time that I had someone when I was in my own graduate path in graduate education and I was talking about becoming a faculty member and she earnestly asked me why. And I had never, and no one had ever paused to ask me that before. <laughs> Everyone had just said, oh, of course, that sounds like a wonderful goal. And to be able to then have to articulate it and to say, oh wait, maybe there are many, many, many other things that I could do and might find as or more fulfilling than becoming a faculty member and going down that path uh, was, was, was life-changing. And so being able to have those moments um, of, of, of asking, and we all, we all know that we're really good at inquiry. So, that's, so that's, the, that's the great thing. We definitely have that capacity. And what would happen if when a grad student walked into the advisor's office, the advisor said, what is your career ambition and why? Yeah. Um, with no assumptions built in. Yeah. Um, if that was coming from the advisor, how powerful. So yeah, I, there's there's some reframing, I, I think. Uh, I did that for the fun. first time this year yeah. because you and Melissa had both suggested something like that. I was like, okay, I'm gonna try it. And the student looked at me like, okay. Um, I, then they immediately said, what, what should it be? And I was like, no, no, let's, you know, they, I mean, but I think it was just still, as you suggested to know that I don't just have a clear one expectation for them that I want to support them through a number. And, you know, that's something I, I, I'm eager to keep working on uh, with advisees into the future, even if they don't know the answer to that yet, that's okay. Um, uh, so we got, uh, there was uh, something that um, Michelle mentioned earlier in that I just want to circle back to real quickly, just something I think Rick and I can pick up on. I wonder if, part of that grad facing series could include conversations with faculty who have experiences outside academia, as well as to provide examples of how we've applied our skills. And we are gonna have a session on February 10th, thinking about PhDs who are in what we would might call para-academic, para I don't know, we don't have a proper name for it, but I, I've been calling it para-academic, um, borrowing from paratextual, but you know, the kind of realizing how rich and robust all the academic careers are outside the tenure track that are expanding in universities at a time when the tenure track is shrinking. So there's so many great jobs that are showing up in universities like ours, and we have many wonderful uh, folks doing that work. So, but I also think there's, as people like Melissa, who've been outside the university uh, before they started working here, folks who have moved back and forth, um, you know, especially as our growing uh, body of, of kind of clinical and teaching faculty um, begins to expand. I think there's lots of opportunities for conversations that make these boundaries feel less rigid. And I think that's a big part of this as well. Um, but in addition to the, to the uh, two sessions that you're offering, which I think looked absolutely terrific, um, I think that uh, faculty who have that experience and can talk to their own students in their own departments um, also have, there's a, there's a different sort of traction to that maybe, or uh, relatability to that. 
And and I, I say this just to I'm I'm glad that there are these these uh, two sessions that you're offering, but I I do push back on um, the statement that somehow we feel that we don't have skills or you know things like I I I don't know I uh, may, maybe we focus our skills and become kind of siloed potentially within in the university as we continue to work here. But personally, like I feel that we have a lot to offer and we and we do have a lot of skills and especially having experience outside of the university. I think that that that, that builds a type of confidence about how those skills can be applied that I've never had the opportunity, for instance, of sharing that with my students. Um, so I think yeah. it'd be kind of interesting. And they might not see that experience because they see you in the professor box um, and they don't imagine that you have a hidden past. <laughs> um, but I think it's very useful for them to see us as multifaceted um, and to understand that there are so many valuable ways to make a living and none of it is worth being squeamish about. Um, I, there's great potential in, in having those conversations. Thank you, Michelle. And, and Lee also mentioned something that she and I have been talking about a lot that within the context of um, you know, work that the collaboratory has been kind of working with, collaborating with her on others on with the digital humanities uh, working group um, that we, you know, that I know for, for both of us and thinking about uh, DH as a way of both making our scholarship public, but also providing uh, other ways of presenting knowledge and skill sets uh, to graduate students is one of the big motivators for uh, that work. Um, to kind of, you know, one of the things I know from talking to grad students who've been out on the uh, uh, kind of on the job market outside of academia is having portfolio and having collaborative skills are the two things that they often feel they don't have, right? They don't want to show their academic papers. Um, and so there's, you know, the collaboration you mentioned, Melissa, I think is, is so important, right? That's, and, and that's an area where I hate to say it, but I'm not sure everybody in all disciplines in the humanities are naturally good at it or even know how to teach it, right? Because of that kind of siloed, you know, monk in the attic um, kind of approach to scholarship. Although many of us have broken out of it, it's still kind of hardwired into a lot of what we do. So, you know, I think that's an area where we can learn a lot from certain fields like comparative studies and WGSS and folklore that have been doing collaborative stuff for a long time, or this, this, the kind of pedagogy that Michelle does with her undergraduates and graduate students that is inherently collaborative. Um, and I think, you know, my own experience has been once you see it, you want to do it, right? It's just contagious, but you need to, you know, we need to learn it too. And so, um, you know, I think kind of sharing the resources for those programs that have done a lot of collaborative Kind of pedagogy in their graduate programs is also going to be useful for departments like mine, you know, and that, and again, even saying departments like mine is wrong. You know, Scott DeWitt and the folks in digital media, they do tons of it. Folks in folklore, they do tons of it. So we're really talking about often sections of large departments that don't have long track histories um, and that might need a little helping hand to get out of the, the, the gate with it. But I think everybody sees the benefits of it. It's, I, I, I really feel everything that you're saying, Jared, and I appreciate it. I do want to push back just a tiny bit, even. Everybody's pushing back on I'm me. Sorry, that's so I know. That's just, <laughs> that's the sign of a great interlocutor. Um, you know, I, I, I'm hearing you say, uh, well, you know, there are departments that, that really are already doing this, and then departments where they're just starting to do it, or there are only some people who are doing it. I will say that when we, as a graduate studies committee said to the rest of the faculty, we're gonna make collaboration a centerpiece of the program and all our graduate students are gonna learn how to collaborate. Our faculty also said, well, but we don't really do collaboration and we don't know how to teach it. And then we went around the table and lo and behold, even the most monkish amongst us, and I am one of them, had to admit, oh yeah, actually I do. I do do certain kinds of collaboration. Even if you're not publishing, like it, even if you're not publishing a co-authored monograph, you stop for a moment and think, oh, well, I did, I did work on this co-edited volume and I have organized this conference and I did put together a round table and I am on 500 committees. 
And actually I collaborate constantly and I've picked up a ton of uh, concrete and social skills that I definitely know how to teach other people. So yeah, yeah, I, I think this You're is, right. I'm really right. echoing, I think Michelle's point here. It's yeah. not at all the case that we don't have skills. If you think you don't have skills, it's only because you haven't taken a moment to, to list them for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think that some of it is the chutzpah. Yeah, it's the yeah, chutzpah yeah, yeah. and the swagger. Getting that swagger back is sure. and and self reflecting, as you say, like really thinking about what we, you know. I love that you were able to push back and say, "But wait, let's actually think about that. What what collaboration have we done?" And people then discovered it. That's great. So Melissa and Jackson, I want to make sure that you have uh, time for some parting shots as as we close here. Um, mindful of the hour, mindful of your time, but I, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. So <laughs> grateful to you both. I mean, I guess I want to give Jackson the last word since I really do think of WGSS as kind of <laughs> starting everything that I'm now <laughs> that I'm now benefiting from. But I think what I want to what I what I want to say for myself and to everyone else is that I think every every time I'm, I'm kind of gearing up for, for something like this, I am also thinking about how depleting the last almost three years have been. And, and, you know, the years before that too, in a lot of, in a lot of ways, right. It's not like we entered the, the period of the pandemic with the humanities being treated with the greatest of respect and, and showered with resources, right? Like I felt depleted then. And it's hard for me even to kind of wrap my head around how I feel now. <clears throat> so the really important thing that I that I learn again and again is that uh, actually uh, in terms of making the program do the things that I think it can do for our graduate students. In terms of the energy and effort that, that I have to put into it, it's actually pretty minimal. I don't have to learn a lot of brand new things. I just have to think about the things I already know how to do that I'm, and that I'm good at. I don't even have to think about the things that I already know how to do and that I'm bad at. I can focus only on I'm good at this, I like it, I know how to do it. I'm just gonna try to teach them how to do that. That's really easy and also makes me feel good. It feels great to do something that you're good at and teach someone else about how you do it. So I think, uh, and I appreciate the energy people have um, already kind of drawn on to be here this afternoon, but I really wanna emphasize, if you're thinking about uh, changes you might try to make really feel confident that they will they will they are likely to be energizing rather than depleting and with that uh, Melissa too the, the just the, the thought of um, of the, the the energy that we can get that we can kind of scoop up from then when you start to to peel back those layers and start to get excited about things, then it kind of begets more changes. And one of the things that I'm so grateful that that we got to connect on this and and talk about in terms of uh, WGSS has been we've been kind of held up as the like the, the look at them leading the charge and it's it's fantastic to have led the charge. And now I'm looking at where you guys are and I'm saying, oh, that's the next iteration. These are the this is the beauty of an iterative process is then being able to then put in and see exactly how other people have done it and have learned and have and have taken up. And then knowing that when you start to put in some of that work and how it snowballs um, and the energy that you get from doing it, how it is a matter of making small changes and small tweaks and adjusting and being able to influence and, and, and change small things like that. And so the thought of being able to, uh, for folks to be able to go back today and just uh, change the conversation a little bit with your advisees. That's a very small change that can get lots of lots of larger things, or the ability to just be able to, um, when we have that a beautiful chip website, to be able to send over the the class that you'll be teaching next next fall to be able to say, hey, this is another example of something that we want to collaborate on, and I want your students to come and join us in this in this class. Those those little things can start to snowball on us, and it doesn't have to take 
um, the thought of like, oh no, not another thing now, not another thing now. And so it's, it's just a slight reframing and a lot of things will go a very long way. And um, I, on, the, on the note of collaboration, I um, am something of a notorious boundless well for excitement around collaboration. So if anybody is thinking about uh, wanting to do more of these things, I, I'd love to um, potentially be that ear for you. If you, need, if you need that ear of someone who, who knows a little bit about what's up, but can say, I have no idea what you just said. Um, that's, that's, I'm, I'm happy to do that and happy to see how we can all, uh, work together to, to elevate this conversation and to help all of the students, uh, that come through graduate education at LSU. Thank you so much for your generosity, your optimism, your warmth, and your care for our students. Um, what a beautiful conversation. I appreciate you both enormously. Thank, Thank you, you all. Thank you all so much. Thank you guys. And, and I put up a link to a kind of reading discussion group we're going to have in a couple of weeks. There'll be lots of things coming up. I will, Rick and I will pester you with lots of opportunities that you can come and join us whenever you uh, have, have time and bandwidth. I find uh, all of this so inspiring and uh, really thank you to Danielle, Melissa and Jackson. This is, has put me in the best mood. Yeah, I would also, I would also thank you and, and also extend gratitude to everyone who was listening in, ears yes. are important. Um, mm -hmm. And CHIP is very much an ongoing conversation. Um, and and uh, we would welcome your, your input and, and thoughts uh, at any point. So uh, again, um, let this be the for uh, an initial step in an ongoing process. So thanks to all of you. Okay. <laughs>